Okay, so great. For the next section, we have the Interpreting Variance and Actionability Group with Deborah Leonard, Levi Garraway, Gail Jarvik, and Elaine Lyon. So why don't we go ahead and start with uh, Gail Jarvik, please. Is there something we can do about the slide fitting? Yeah, let's see if this continues to be a problem. Okay. Well, maybe it'll work. Um, so hopefully I don't have to convince most of us here that in order to really be um, effective and, uh, and safe with genomic medicine, we need to know what a lot of variants do that we don't know now. Um, germline uh, variant pathogenicity is a critical problem. Uh, we need to interpret these, and we also have to agree on a consistent way to interpret these variants. Um, I think we're all aware that every person has many, many rare variants. When we look at a genome or an exome, we see very many rare variants, and we need to know what a lot of these things do. When we look in ClinVar, which is a very important tool in clinical medicine, there are only over 100,000 variants that have clinical assertions for pathogenicity. And uh, per Heidi Rehm, if there are multiple assertions for a certain variant, 17 percent of the time in ClinVar, they do not match. Um, so you've heard a little bit about the um, CSER Bake Off. This is the Bake Off 2.0. We had another one a year ago that I won't be talking about. I mean, I'm going to highlight some things that Katrina didn't uh, go into in detail for the Bake Off. So we took 99 variants, nine variants, um, all nine labs looked at. The rest of the variants, three or more labs looked at. And we looked for agreement. And the first thing is we, we classified them using our usual lab classification, and then we tried to use the brand new ACMG criteria to classify them. So this is actually matching within a lab. So the same lab using their own versus the ACMG criteria. And so there's about 80 percent concordance, so that's good. But one of the things you can see is that um, see if I can. up here, the, these 11 variants are variants where the labs were very comfortable calling them benign or likely benign, but the ACMG criteria were not. And so that's a trend that we saw, that the labs wanted to call more things benign than the ACMG criteria let you call, and that has to do with the rules around making something benign in ACMG versus what the labs use. So this is sort of an iterative process to inform back the ACMG guidelines that maybe they're too conservative about when they call something benign. And um, similarly, they're a little conservative on the other end as well. Uh, you saw this slide as well, which is the um, agreement across labs, a third of the time we all agree, um, a little bit more of the time we're off by one level. But um, what I want to highlight on this is that uh, this is using the ACMG criteria or the lab's own criteria. And so you can see, it doesn't take a statistician, to see that using the ACMG criteria did not improve our agreement across labs. And so that was a very interesting finding and a little bit concerning that our consistency didn't improve using these guidelines because that was a major point of them. The ACMG guidelines allow you to think about the variants in a standardized way, but also that should lead to more standardized conclusions. Um, when we dig into specific variants, and this is where I hear Jim Evans telling me to stay out of the weeds, um, so you're going to just stop me, Jim, when I go too far, um, that uh, this is just one example, and it gives you some idea of the things that we're learning about the rules. So this is a variant. Uh, it, the variant itself isn't that important, but you can see that um, under each laboratory's own rules, this is how they would classify it, and under ACMG rules, this is how they would classify it. So there's correlation. Once people have kind of made up their minds, sometimes they find the rules to, to follow their hearts. Um, also, you're allowed to overrule the ACMG classifications. That's one of the things that's allowed. So sometimes there's an overrule here. But you can see that um, for the labs that wanted to call it pathogenic, they were much more interested in the co-segregation evidence. They were much more convinced by the co-segregation evidence. So one of the shortcomings of the criteria that we found is that co-segregation is undefined. It says, do, do these co-segregate? But there's no definition around that, so people will use that criteria differently. Functional evidence has been another problem area that we've found across many, many variants. Functional evidence is how does it behave in a test tube? But it's supposed to be a well-established criteria that correlates with disease. And there are actually very few of those, with malignant hyperthermia maybe being a very good example of one that we do believe. Uh, so many times people are using these functional evidence that are published 
without really meeting the standard of being well established to other people. Um, computational, this is your GURP score, your CAD score, your polyfin, and people use that more consistently. There was uh, high uh, scores for this. Um, a big difference here is minor allele frequency above the disease frequency. You can see the people who uh, noticed the minor allele frequency was too high for the disease were much more likely to not call it pathogenic. In fact, this variant was quite common. What was interesting, it's a recessive disorder, and a few of the labs said, well, we don't apply that criteria for recessives, but it's pretty simple math um, and should be applied there. Um, you could see a couple outliers for um, a missense gene where mis missenses are rare in the gene. That's another one where there's no quantitative criteria. Um, what does that mean? Does that mean below the mean, below the fifth percentile for having missenses? No definition. Um, and then we also found that um, this, the phenotype specific to the gene in this case is really an error because there was no phenotype in this case. Um, but this was very misused in many, many classifications. It really meant there's really only one gene that does this, but it was often invoked for well-known genes, but for highly genetically heterogeneous conditions, which was not in the intent. So we're going through, looping back, trying to find ways to clarify the guidelines, finding common errors. There were a few common errors that were made in interpretation of the guideline or application of the guidelines. And um, we are presenting this at the American Society of Human Genetics. We have a four-hour educational session at the American College of Medical Genetics meeting. To, and, and of course, this will be written as a paper as well. Uh, we we uh, s came to consensus after many calls on um, 69 of the 99 variants. And the rest we just don't agree on. All right, so I think we would all like a sorting hat for variants. That would be great, <laughs> something magical. Um, that'd be really helpful, um, but there's no question that there is a lot of more work to do in getting variant classification more consistent uh, across groups and improving the guidelines. We want to continue to identify the sources of variation and how we classify variants. And um, also, as was pointed out, uh, CSER has been a major depositor to ClinVar, and we feel like that's an important part of our mission. Of course, if variant classification is wrong, then patients get managed incorrectly. So it's a big clinical problem. And I can say as a clinical geneticist that it's common for me to disagree with the variant classification that a clinical lab has provided for one of my patients, particularly likely pathogenic. I often don't agree with them um, that there's not much data there. We are very interested in expanding to non CSER labs and, in fact, um, non academic labs, companies. Uh, low penetrance variants are a particular problem. You may have noticed Katrina said we had 98 variants and I said we had 99. One of them was dropped out of some of the analyses because it was a low penetrance variant. There is no classification for that under the current ACMG system. You would call it benign for high penetrance, but some labs aren't, from, you know, they, knew, they said, well, it's pathogenic for low penetrance, I'm not going to call it benign for high penetrance and just didn't classify it at all. So that's a problem that's entirely untouched. Right, so what are our opportunities um, to maximize variants that are classified? Well, first of all, I'd like to stress that I think that exome and genome level data is the right data for this problem. Um, it allows you, obviously, a broader look at the um, whole genome. It allows you to come back to new genes that are associated with your condition in the future. And it allows you to take um, variants of interest from the public. So I know that the exome variant server, for example, gets many queries. We see this variant in your server. Can you phenotype the patient for X? And the answer to that for the, the exome variant server is no. But for CSER, the answer to that can be yes. We could come back due to an outside request and say, yeah, sure, we'll bring that patient back in and we will look at them carefully for that phenotype. Similarly, we want to reanalyze the sequence data when there are phenotype changes in the patient or when there are new genes that are associated with the conditions of interest. And then another opportunity for variant classification is that there are multiple initiatives to do really high throughput assays to classify variants for pathogenicity in an in vitro way. And we could partner with those activities in order to see if a variant that we see as pathogenic or not pathogenic, that the consistent result is found in those um, high throughput assays. 
I just wanted to dig in a little bit deeper on the re-phenotype uh, idea and give you a specific case. So this is a patient who actually uh, was collected through a colorectal cancer phenotype. But as we went through the whole exome, we found this variant. And this variant is published in the literature associated with this disease, uh, hereditary hemorrhagic T-line dictasia. And if you see down here, these little red dots on the person's lip are these vascular anomalies. And so you see these on the patient's skin. You see them on their tongue, their mucous membranes. They get nosebleeds. They get GI bleeds. And they have uh, larger arteriovenous malformations in their organs. And that these can lead to hemorrhaging in the lungs and, in particular, hemorrhaging in the brain. Um, so it's a very significant disease. Uh, and the disease frequency about 1 in 5,000. This variant's frequency is about 1 in 5,000. So you're already a little dubious of this report in the literature because there are many known variants for this disease in this gene. And when one variant starts to account for the whole group, you're a little concerned about that. Um, and then when we were able to bring this patient back, and on return, the patient had a completely normal skin and mucous membrane uh, exam. They had no history of nosebleeds whatsoever. The patient was 56. And this patient, we don't even really need to um, CT them or you know, image them for ABMs. They're unaffected. And so we can put this data to ClinVar. And um, the next person who comes along with this variant, uh, particularly if it's a young child, you'll have better data about that this clearly isn't a highly penetrant variant if it's a disease variant at all. Um, so this is a real opportunity to improve medical care for people in the future. Other opportunities, uh, we talked about the tumor sequence data and how people are finding actionable results in tumor sequence, but that has to be followed up downstream to see if that changes outcomes for those people. The electronic health record integration, I think, is an important point. That was, it was a good question earlier, how it differs from eMERGE. And I would say that eMERGE isn't dealing with exome and genome data. And even in eMERGE 3, they'll have 100 genes sequenced. And so how you get a whole genome or exome captured in the electronic health record in a useful way, I think, is a problem that CSER is uniquely um, addressing. There is a big need for uh, training, clinical training, and training of a diverse workforce. We want to get more uh, patients that are diverse. But part of that is having a workforce that's diverse. We have over 200 clinical practitioners in CSER, which is very unique. One of the reasons we've had such a focus on clinical implementation. Uh, finally, we're very interested in, as Dan Roden pointed out, the interactions between the clinician, the genetic counselor, and the patient. What's the best way to communicate this information in person? What's the best way to communicate it in reports, interactions with the primary care provider? And we have an opportunity to look at more diverse populations as well. Um, so gene lists, I think we all know that there's times when a list is useful, like the naughty and nice list. But um, for genes, uh, gene lists have never really been studied. So most labs that look at specific phenotypes, they'll do a whole genome or exome, but they will look at a list of genes that they know are associated with that condition. Well, that focuses your attention. It saves you time but it also limits your ability for discovery of variants that are outside that space that may be associated with your phenotype. So this is an opportunity to really study whether that approach is the best approach. Uh, for incidental findings, the incidental finding list in general, there's general agreement that an actionable list is useful to look at on a genomic or exomic test. Some people would have a broader or a more narrow list. And a list of lists or um, consensus list may be uh, helpful. So the major themes then today, determination of pathogenicity and sources of variability and interpretation of variants. I think it is a very unique space that CSER has addressed in partnership with the ACMG criteria. Um, we have had the ability to really test those guidelines and see how well they're working for us and see where improvement can, can be made. Reanalysis of data in light of new information, what are the implications of using or not using a gene list, and results reporting to physician and patient. And I will just end by uh, acknowledging both the Bake Off team, which I cannot stress how many hours. We have, we've spent like a half hour to 45 minutes on a single variant on some of these calls. Um, so this team has really worked hard. And then, of course, the whole CSER team represented by the UO1PIs here. 
Um, so with that, I think we're going to go to Elaine and then take questions later. Yeah.